Hello, everybody. On behalf of Mayor Megan George, I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Landlord Seminar. Um, we're excited to bring this to you remotely this year again. COVID-19 and the Delta variant has forced us all to make dramatic adjustments to our lives. Hopefully we have all made these adjustments and are continuing to practice safe habits, including frequent hand washing, social distance, and the wearing of masks. We at City Hall are working diligently to abide by these practices and stay healthy. I encourage everyone, if you haven't already done so, to get your COVID vaccine shot. Together we will get through this. City Hall is open to the public. Masks are required prior to entry. While there is staff at City Hall, some continue to work remotely. Please feel free to call or email questions or concerns. We will address these promptly. This year's seminar is a required attendance in compliance with your housing license. Also available on the city's website is a manual for landlords entitled Best Rental Practices. This is filled with lots of good information and is located at lakewoodoh.gov. That is lakewoodoh, one word, dot gov. We have an exciting lineup of speakers tonight, today, that include Andrew Fleck, our city prosecutor, Sean Leininger, our director of planning and development, and Chris Parmalee, our building commissioner. Chris will be the final speaker. I thank you for your attendance today and look forward to seeing you in the spring for our next seminar. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Andrew Fleck. Andrew Fleck has been a prosecutor here at the city for uh, over five years now. And uh, Andrew is here to speak of our nuisance ordinance uh, and how it affects landlords and tenants alike. Uh, Andy. Thank you, Brian. Uh, give me just a second, I'll share my screen here. I have okay. PowerPoint for everyone. All right. As Brian said, my name is Andrew Fleck. I'm the assistant prosecutor and the assistant law director here for the city. I run the city's criminal nuisance program. I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes today about how to what the criminal nuisances are and how you can avoid one. As a landlord in the city of Lakewood, you can receive a nuisance notification letter from the city for any criminal activity uh, that ori originates from your property and occurs over and over. Uh, repeated visits uh, from members of our different departments, building department, fire department, police department, uh, are some of the more frequent things that do cause those type of responses. We feel that the owners of properties, landlords, are in the best position to take control of those nuisances. You, you are the ones that control who is renting your property uh, and you are ultimately responsible for the activity that's going on there well maybe you don't live there, uh, you are applying for licenses with the city and uh, generating income uh, from those rentals so that you, we expect you to take responsibility and to take control of those situations. We've had this law since uh, 2008. Um, when we do send out a nuisance uh, notification letter, it'll have a, an estimate in it. The estimate is for anything uh, that the city has to use to abate the problem that's going on. So let's, as an example, let's say that you have a frequent noise problem. One of your tenants plays their radio all the time and the police uh, constantly go over to the house. After we've received a uh, sufficient number of calls, we'll send you a letter, dear Mr. Doe, uh, that your property at 123 John Street has become a nuisance. Here is a copy of the calls that the city has gone on. Here's the estimate that it's cost the city $276 or whatever you may have um, in, in abating the nuisance and writing people citations or just going over and advising them and turn it down, whatever the situation may be. Um, we're not required to write a citation uh, in order for it to be considered a nuisance, just to verify that the activity is occurring and within 1,000 feet of your property. 
uh, once you don't have to pay anything at that time, but if we get a third incident at your property within one calendar year from the first date, then we can send you a bill from then on. These are the frequent things that uh, we typically see as criminal nuisance, disorderly conducts, noise violations, uh, drugs and gambling, littering, health and safety, alcohol, animal violations. The ones in red are the most common. Sex offenses, theft, weapons, vandalism, obstructing official business, building code things, high grass, weeds, rats, garbage on your property, any felony offenses. Uh, in 2015, I believe we added false alarms uh, for police calls. Uh, recently, in the last couple of months, we've added false alarms for fire calls. So be aware that having an alarm system at your property and not properly training people how to use it can generate uh, a nuisance uh, for you as the owner. The full uh, representation of the Lakewood Criminal Nuisance Code is in uh, Lakewood Codified Ordinance 510. I uh, posted the link here. Uh, so you can see how to get uh, directly to that. You can read the code. It gives you kind of a more detailed explanation. I'm just kind of touching, covering the bases here. Evidence of two uh, misdemeanor or minor misdemeanor offenses or any one felony offense will trigger uh, the writing of the nuisance notification letter. In addition, three false alarms in six months or four in a year will uh, trigger that same letter. We send a letter out to the uh, to the property owner. So a lot of times the letter is not going to the tenant. Sometimes uh, if I can tell that the, it's not an owner-occupied property, I do try to send the letter also to the tenant so that they're aware that this is a problem. But we do expect you as the property owner uh, to be handling a majority of that situation and not rely on us to be notifying your tenant for you. Uh, we expect you to respond with some type of plan of action. Uh, the best, the best practice is to respond to us in writing and tell us what it is that you are doing or aren't doing or what problems you're having with the tenant. If you've begun an eviction, how long you expect that would take. Uh, if you've properly screened tenants, uh, all kinds of things. But response in writing is preferable. That way we have a copy of it. Email is acceptable. Uh, we can put it in the file and uh, keep it in there so that we know how you're responding to the property. If we continue to receive problems, we haven't received anything in writing from you, we'll assume that you're doing nothing and continue to proceed uh, accordingly through uh, the nuisance code situation. Like we said, it's two uh, minor or minor misdemeanor, misdemeanor or minor misdemeanor offenses or one felony offense within a calendar year. Um, if you receive a subsequent offense, it goes for an additional year from that offense. So let's say you had a violation on January 1st and June 1st and on September 1st, First, we have your third violation. We'll send you a letter. <clears throat> the period that the look back period for the city purposes will be to January 1st. And if you don't have any more violations by January 1st, then you'll go back to the beginning. The, the process will be over for you and you'll start fresh. Uh, if, however, on December 31st, you get a new violation, it starts a new year at that point from December 31st to the following December 31st. And if you could go 364 days and another violation happens on June, on December 30th, then you'll have another year from then. It's until you have a successful year from the first violation to the last uh, without having any um, subsequent calls to your property uh, for the same type of activity. Uh, the owner gets assessed in, if we get the third one, it's called the de nuisance declaration, uh, you'll get assessed the actual cost that the city spends abating. So that's the time that the law department spends uh, reviewing calls, the time the police department spends, the time the fire department spends, or building department, whatever department it is, if they drive any vehicles, how much gas, mileage, paper, stamps that we have to send the stuff out to you on, all of it gets aggregated. It'll be put on, like I said, the first estimate during the notification, and then it'll be sent as an invoice uh, if you receive a third violation within the year. Uh, if you don't pay the violation, it is due within 30 days. Uh, then they'll put a lien, the city will put a lien on your property uh, by the taxes and you'll end up paying it uh, that way. If you don't agree with the, with the declaration of nuisance, uh, you can request a reconsideration to the mayor's office uh, within 30 days of the declaration. Uh, if the mayor decides to uphold the declaration, then you have the right to appeal it to the nuisance, uh, the Board of Nuisance Abatement Appeals. Uh, it's very rare that we let things get to that level. Most of the time we're able to work it out either by us notifying you that there's a problem at your property and you want to take action uh, or uh, sending a bill or two usually gets the job done. Uh, 
kind of makes it easier for everyone in that way. Uh, we have had a couple cases go to the nuisance board of appeals, but not very many. Uh, this is just touching on what I already said, the wage of the city people that are called to the scene, use of the vehicles, invoicing, uh, issuance of the lien, uh, could be done through the auditor's office or we could, the city could take a civil action against you. If you do come before the nuisance board, you can prevail if you can prove that you weren't the owner at the time of the nuisance or you were taking every feasible action to rectify the known nuisance problems. Uh, if you have a real problem tenant and you're doing everything you can, uh, we're not going to hold that against you, but we are going to take a look at it. And if we can determine that you're not doing what you need to do to get the situation resolved for the neighbors in the neighborhood, um, the enforcement action is going to be taken on behalf of the city. Some successful things that people have done to show us that they're taking care of it, evict tenants, uh, enforcing terms of their leases agreements, complying with your landlord obligations in ORC uh, 5. 321.04. We've had over 400 properties that have been placed in the nuisance program since 09. We've only had six get to the board uh, to that level. Like I said, most of the times so we're able to uh, come to a satisfactory resolution. So how can you avoid uh, getting to the point where you have a chronic nuisance occurring at your property? You can screen your tenants, doing background checks, searching court dockets, at least here, probably Cleveland, probably Cuyahoga County would be good places to start. All those are free. It's about, you can go on there. You don't have to put in your name. You don't have to put in uh, anything other than a person's name and you can see what kind of cases have been generated against them. You can see if they've prior been evicted. That's good information for you to know. If they have uh, prior criminal history and whatnot, you can see all that stuff if you're looking in the proper court. Uh, respond when we send you a notice notification. Call us, send us an email, something in writing. Hey, here's what my plan of action is. I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z so that we know that you're taking care of the problem. Uh, it's not going to be a situation where we're kind of allowing the stuff to cross in the mail and hitting you with violations that uh, you've been addressing, but you just haven't gotten back to us. We want to know what you're doing right away so that we can properly decide how to proceed forward if we continue to receive calls. Ultimately, it's your responsibility. Uh, your property is your responsibility, so you need to check on your property. If you live out of town, it probably means driving by every once in a while, see what's going on there, if the place is being kept up. If it, there's been any problems or whatnot. Uh, these are some resources for you. You can go to lakewoodoh.gov. As Brian said, uh, put in here how to get exactly right to the landlord uh, training seminar where the best practices book is. This is the link for that. So you can go to apply register at the top banner, select landlord training seminar. All those information will be there. There's also information on uh, proposed screening tools, rental agreements, crisis resolution, things of that nature. You know, this is an important part of our city. The city does have 52% uh, non-owner occupied properties. So we do take uh, absentee landlords very seriously. If you have any remaining questions, I've put my email here, my phone number direct to my desk. Uh, you can give me a call. You can send me an email with any questions you might have. Uh, and again, here at the end is another link uh, just to the codified ordinances for the city of Lakewood. The nuisance code is under uh, section 510. So you can check that out if you have any questions, uh, give me a call back. I'm gonna pass it off now to Sean Leinecker, our uh, Director of um, Planning and Development. Okay. Thank okay. you, Andy. I'm gonna give me just a second to get my screen shared. So Brian, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Awesome, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. This is my first time having the opportunity to talk to the landlord community. So it, it's always good to share some, some relevant information that's going on around the community. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk to you about is, uh, first of all, just highlight some of the things that we've been working on in the plan and development department, particularly as it relate to, to our rental housing. Uh, and then talk about some of the major projects that are taking place uh, throughout the city. Um, so where I want to start is uh, really what we've been really focused on in the last uh, 18 months or so, which is on providing COVID-19 assistance. 
So shortly after the issuance of the stay-at-home order, that, that ultimately shut down the entire state of Ohio and, and most parts of the country for, for at least two months. Uh, the city launched uh, several programs, including a small business assistance program and, and soon after that, a residential rent assistance program. Uh, the small business assistance program, in case you weren't aware, uh, provides up to $7,000 for rent or job retention assistance to qualifying businesses that have up to 50 employees. Uh, so if Lake would be driven by small business, that, that includes most businesses in the community. Uh, the other program that we propped up, which is, was, which is important for, for, for as landlords for you to be aware of, uh, and it still exists today, is the Residential Rent Assistance Program. And that provides rent assistance to income qualified residents that have or are being financially impacted by the pandemic. And so the slide here shows you what we've, what we've done with that, those funds so far. Uh, so we've provided over, we've awarded over 758 applications for residential rent assistance, another 216 on the small business side. And, and, and really what the, the key part of that is, is on the residential component is that we've, we've helped over 1400 residents uh, stay in their, in their units. Uh, by providing one, over $1.3 million in assistance and on the, the small business side, $840,000. So while the, the small business program is closed out uh, or is coming to a close, there's still a little bit of funds left there that are, that are at this point spoken for. Uh, we have recently added another $1.6 million to the residential rent assistance program. So that means there's money still available. Uh, so if you have a renter um, in the city that qualifies, uh, please have them reach out to our partners at the Lakewood Community Services Center. Again, it's the Lakewood Community Services Center. Uh, they can take their app, they can talk to them, talk and see if they, they qualify for this rent assistance. And often what happens is if they do qualify, uh, the payments are direct, made directly to you as the landlord um, to help keep them in their, in their place um, during this, this, this odd time that we're living in. So let's talk a little bit about then development activity uh, in Lakewood, because there has been a lot going on despite a two month shutdown uh, and a number of other things. But so, and development activity is also one of the, the great indicators of the strength of investment that's happening uh, throughout. Um, and then we measure that by building permit activity. And so in, in 2020, uh, going back a year uh, when the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic really set in, both permit activity and construction valuation remain strong. Uh, in fact, we had our fourth highest permit volume year and our fifth highest construction value year out of the last 10 years. Moving forward, yes, COVID-19 is still impacting uh, our labor supply material availability, our material prices. It is uh, slowing down projects, um, but it hasn't stopped projects. So projects are still on the boards. Developers are still moving forward with them. It's just at a lot different pace than what we originally anticipated. And unfortunately, the additional variants of, of COVID-19 that, that come about continue to, to, to slow those projects, delay those projects. So it's also important to note that the large scale projects that I'm gonna talk about here in a second, uh, that most of you are probably aware of. Uh, so the downtown site, the former hospital site, the Solov project, Studio West, et cetera. Those are still advancing. And so over the next two to three years, we're gonna, we're gonna see over $150 million in additional permit activity come to the city. So another great indicator of investment, uh, especially in a bedroom community like Lakewood is, is home sales. Um, so on this slide, we're, we're, we're trying to just depict what's been happening the last five years in the single family home market, uh, which then impacts of course the residential market uh, indirectly. Uh, so what we've seen is the median sale price increase uh, 56% from $154,000 back in two, 2016 to $240,000 in 2020. And so if we go back a little bit further, it's not on this slide, but if we go back to 2011 data, uh, our, when the median sales price was $112,200, the increase to 2020 is 114%. So not only are homes selling for more, uh, more of them are selling and they're not seen on the market for long. So last year, 586 single family homes sold, uh, which was a 10 year high. And the median days that they were on the market was 30, was 30 days, which was a 10 year low. Uh, it's important to know too, of all those transactions that happened, those 586 single family home transactions, 55% of those, those closings were at or above the list price. So that's, that's great news if you're a homeowner and wanting to sell uh, in, the, in the city of Lakewood. Um, but the trade-off of that is, is, is it does impact and put a tremendous amount of pressure on affordability in the city. Uh, so 
To counter that, the city does have an award-winning affordable housing strategy that helps guide our investment in what we do with affordable housing initiatives. Now, primarily we receive federal CDBG and home funds that we invest in the construction and rehab of both owner-occupied and rental housing that support income qualified households. So landlords, if you do have, if, if you are supporting income qualified households, there may be rental assistance or there could be rehab assistance, I should say, um, that we can help you invest in, you, in your buildings. Uh, and reach out to Mary Lee. She's our program administrator here. Uh, you'll have my contact information at the end of the slide. Um, any of those phone numbers or my email will, will get you to Mary. Uh, but she can help direct you to some of those, those, those assistance programs that we have. So in 2020, with those assistance programs, we provided over $545,000 to support 44 properties, including the rehab and sale of a home on Orchard Grove. Um, and in addition to the rehab, repair, accessibility, maintenance programs um, that we manage, we also are building two new single family homes that are to be sold to, to income qualified households. And these are a couple of renderings of those homes on the slide right here. Uh, one is on, on Shaw, the other down on Clover. Uh, and they're, for the most part, they're, they're on the outside, they're, they're, they're nearly complete. A couple of touch up things to do on the inside. Uh, in addition to investing our, our federal funds into affordable housing, we also, we also make available property tax abatement incentive to developers to provide affordable housing. And I'll talk about that uh, as it relates to a, a couple of solo uh, multifamily projects here in a, in a couple of slides. So let's share some news about just a, a, a handful of, of, of the development projects that are going on around the city. And we'll start on the residential side since we're, since we're, we're talking about uh, with the landlord community. Uh, the, the, the first project we'll talk about are the Lake Avenue homes. Uh, so this is the former marathon site uh, in Ward 3 in the city on Lake Avenue. Uh, just off to the right here is Nicholson Avenue, um, uh, but the former marathon site. So WXZ development uh, came in, uh, proposed to, 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 to adaptively reuse the, the former, former marathon gas station, clean up the site. There were some underground storage tanks on it. Uh, and they're putting uh, four uh, attached single family homes uh, that are connected uh, from the from Lake Avenue. It'll look like there are there are two single family homes sit there, sitting there. Behind it, connected by the by the garage, will be then a, a, a another pair of homes for a total of four units. Um, so this is a street view looking into the site off of Lake Avenue. As you can see from the street, since this is a single family neighborhood, uh, it keeps that single family appearance. But then as you come kind of from the side view, you get a little bit of a peek back and you can see how the garage is connected to, to a second home at the back of the property. And so this was a creative solution to figure out how to balance some of the costs that were associated with the remediation of a, of a, of a site that had some contamination from underground storage tanks. Uh, and, and that site, that property is actually uh, under construction right now. Uh, we have uh, footers foundations are in. I don't think they've gone vertical yet. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been out to that site, but uh, this project is under construction after some, some COVID delays. Another project that's uh, that, that started now waiting for, uh, we talked a little bit about COVID at the beginning of the presentation. COVID's impacting this and we're waiting for, for labor and materials to catch up to the project. Um, but there's the Marlowe Park townhomes uh, at the corner of Marlowe and Madison Avenue. Uh, so in this case, uh, the former, uh, St. Clement Catholic Parish School has, has been sold. The, the church on the right side of the property still remains. Uh, been sold uh, to, to Liberty Development, who has demolished the, the, former, the former school and is reusing it to, to construct 16 townhomes. So looking at the site, uh, this is the, the, the homes on that will face onto Madison, kind of keeping that commercial character of, of Madison Avenue uh, before then turning the corner down onto Marlowe uh, with a more residential flavor to the architecture as you, as you make the turn. So again, this is the start of construction now, which we're just, we're, we're in kind of a holding period waiting for that to get going. So two significant multifamily developments that have been um, in the news and, and on our books recently are, are called the View West and the View East. Both are being developed by Jerome Solov Development. Uh, what they are is they're, they're mixed use projects. Uh, this is the, the View West. Uh, contain 160 residential units, about 1,500 square feet of commercial space. Uh, and with that, there will be 32 affordable residential units. And it's located on Detroit Avenue uh, between Rosewood uh, and Cranford. I guess Northland can, is kind of the, the eastern western boundary here as well. Um, but so this is the former Barry Buick properties. Um, 
as I shared previously, the, the, the city has recently made available a tax incentive to provide affordable housing. So this, along with the, the sister project that's on the next slide, uh, these will be the first projects that utilize this incentive. And, and so uh, what this does in this case, we're so using this one as an example. So 20% of the building or 32 units, since there's 160 units, will be made affordable for, for, for a period of 15 years. Uh, and so Sola right now, Sola is working um, uh, to complete the property acquisitions, the construction drawings, and, and we're hopeful this starts to, to really start to take shape here in the spring of, of, of 22. Uh, but this is a multifamily project. Uh, this is a view of it looking, uh, we're looking east down Detroit towards downtown, um, two sister buildings flanking either side of Detroit. So then the other project, again, by Jerome Solov Development, um, is the view east, uh, smaller sibling, if you will, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Berry site. This is the former Spitzer Chrysler uh, that sits near Detroit and Bunce. Um, so it's mixed use, 120 units spread across four stories, uh, two different buildings uh, flanking Parkwood. Uh, and this project will also include affordable housing units. And so it's a little bit smaller. So in this case, 120% uh, of 120 is 24. So 24 units will be made affordable for 15 years. Uh, Solov has uh, been through our architectural board review. And so similar to the Berry site, they're working through property acquisitions. And um, this one's about a six month stagger in time from the, the West project. Uh, so we look for this a little bit later in 2022 to, to, to take off. Uh, this is a rendering of well, at least one of the buildings. They're, they're, they're essentially sister buildings. This one's a little bit, I guess this, they call this the alpha, but it's a little bit taller, has a little bit more width to it. Um, uh, then there's another building sitting on the other corner, so you get a sense of the architecture of this one. But again, a multifamily, multifamily project. So let's switch gears now and move over to the commercial projects that are taking place throughout the city. Uh, we, we are fortunate we have a number of adaptive reuses, reuse projects that are taking historic buildings and repurposing them throughout the, throughout the city. So this one is uh, Daniel Budish and Betsy Figge. Uh, they're leading the development team that will take and convert the former Mac products manufacturing space that's located on Heard Avenue, right behind the former Fantasy Nightclub. They're gonna turn this into an LGBTQ entertainment and restaurant venue. So it's 20,000 square feet of, of adaptive reuse. Uh, it's gonna be occupied, at least on the Mac products building, be, be occupied by a Latinx restaurant, a pizza kitchen. Uh, and then really the, the signature of it is the, the back portion of the building uh, is gonna support a mezzanine track, fitness, volleyball, dodgeball, and, and really provide a, a sports complex for the Stonewall sports community. So this is the rendering of, of the, it's called the field house. Uh, this will be the first phase of a multi-phase project that'll include then the building, the fantasy building um, um, up at the corner of Detroit and Heard which is also gonna provide a range of opportunities and support the LGBTQ community. When it's complete, the Studio West complex is not only gonna serve uh, in, as an anchor for the gay community, but it's also gonna serve as a, a, Easter, a, a, a D Eastern Detroit Avenue gateway into the city. So the, the field house is actually under construction. Uh, the permits have been issued um, and hopefully we'll be opening here uh, early to mid uh, 2022. Uh, and then the fantasy, uh, they're going through uh, some design process now, and we look to see that one start a little bit later in 2022, but maybe as uh, soon as first thing, first phase will be getting the, the storefronts that used to be there, get those renovated and get the, the storefronts occupied before then converting the rest of the nightclub complex. Uh, so the next project is the Nest. Uh, this is our Birdtown neighborhood. Um, it's the former Byright building. It, and it's been, occupied, been purchased by Little Jimmy, which is uh, Jim Makito uh, and his group. Um, they're gonna take and uh, this mixed use, uh, take the, the Byright building and turn it into a mixed use building. Uh, it does involve historic preservation, adaptive reuse, um, adaptive reuse taking the, what was the, 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 the supermarket on the first floor and put it into a smaller scale retail. Uh, this has been awarded federal uh, and Ohio historic preservation tax credits to help make it all come together. Uh, so the first floor uh, will be uh, a host of, of, of retail and restaurant uses, as well as a coffee shop, uh, with the upper floors then being filled out with uh, service businesses, um, including a salon uh, and, and some other uses. And then the back, there will be a residential dwelling uh, for the historic, there's, there's a historic home or a historic uh, dwelling unit at the back of this building that will remain uh, for residential purposes. 
So these aren't as flashy as some of the other images that I had, but uh, these are some line drawings just showing uh, really kind of peeling off all the stuff that's been applied to the to the building since it was built um, and kind of return, returning it back to its former glory. Uh, so this is looking along Madison. This is the elevation looking back towards, uh, back off of Robin. Um, off to the left here, that's the, 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 the dwelling unit that's there. And then popping up an elevator to provide access to the second and third floors as well as a rooftop access to the building. So continuing that vein of, of, of adaptive reuse and, and historic preservation. Uh, the next project is the Trinity Church. Uh, this was actually purchased by the city uh, as a protective buy to prevent the demolition of, of, of this historic building and the historic commercial storefronts. Um, Subsequently, after purchasing the property, the city went through an RFQ, RFP process to select a developer that would ultimately take and preserve the buildings and adaptively reuse them. And through that RFP process, Scalish Construction was selected. Um, they have gone through and going to convert this into, um, the direction they're going right now is to an office um, and, and, and hospitality use. Office being the use throughout the existing church and the former classroom um, addition that was on the building, putting hospitality restaurant businesses up on the storefronts. And then there's a potential for a carriage house that'll have some residential units in the future. But for now, as a result of COVID, that portion of the project is on hold and, and really looking to get these, these first elements moving forward with some approximately 11,000 square feet of retail, commercial and office space. Um, the residential units might come later. So rendering just showing the church, just really keeping everything the way it is because there are historic tax credits involved in the project, um, really repurposing, re, re, uh, rehabilitating the, the exterior of the windows uh, and trying to retain as much of that historic character as possible. Uh, one of our final projects is the St. James School. This, so this is something that just came up on our radar pretty quick in the last year. Um, so the entire St. James complex, the, the, the rectory, the, 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 the school, uh, as well as then the Catholic Church are all designated as historic district in the city of Lakewood. Um, the, the church and the rectory, I'm sorry, the school and the rectory have been vacant for some time. They've, even though they've had some couple of uses that have been, been, been put in them through the years. Um, but Oster Services, um, Sean Nugent, and they partnered with Liberty Development, um, have been able to acquire uh, the rights to the, 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 this property from, from, the, from the Catholic Bishop's office. Um, and are, are in the process of acquiring it and going to basically retrofit the school and then eventually the, the rectory um, into an office building or for office uses. Um, the, the school will be the first phase to go. Actually, they're just getting started on some initial work, uh, uh, some demo work through the building. Uh, Oster Services is ultimately going to occupy the first floor of the building. They're going to populate the rest of the building with um, with like-minded businesses from the construction industry or, or, or allied trades, and then kind of building up onto the third floor uh, uh, with the retention of a technology company here in the, in the city of Lakewood. So really excited about this uh, coming forward um, and, and saving one of, the, um, one of the historically designated buildings in the community. And these are just some renderings of, of the school Again, not as pretty a pictures as I had for some of the other ones, just some line drawings, but at least showing you that rebuilding the steps uh, that are at the front facing Detroit that are pretty poor shape right now, uh, basically retrofitting or saving windows wherever they can by reglazing them and, and just bringing the building up to code uh, for, for commercial use. So then the, the last project I want to talk about is the, the one that is probably the, the most familiar to everybody and it's, um, it's our downtown redevelopment site. And so a lot's changed in the past year or two with, re with respect to this site. Obviously, I showed you an aerial of this uh, from just a couple of years ago. There would be a hospital on there um, prior to it being demolished in, in 2019. And so this is very similar to what we, how we see the site today. Um, as you're perhaps aware, um, last year, the city did separate from the previous developer. Um, and we, 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 we pivoted to Casto and North Point Realty Team, who were the other developer that was selected through the 2017 RFP process. Uh, in fact, last December, City Council approved that pivot to Casto and North Point Realty. Since then, we've been working on a, a lot of different things related to the site. As, as I mentioned, a lot has changed. 
um, uh, since Casto and North Point last saw the site in 2017. So we've been working with them to tell them, update them with where they where we are uh, on, on the demolition, uh, on some other issues that are related to the site. And in turn, they're trying to take and adapt their proposal uh, and modify it accordingly to, to put the um, put an updated proposal together to the city. So the images that are shown here are not current. These are from the original RFP submittal, uh, and those will be updated here um, as we go through this process. At the same time, we're also negotiating a, a term sheet that provides the basis of a more detailed development agreement. Um, and that'll be finalized as we get deeper into the design and the, and the approval process, um, as well as the public review process. Um, along, this, uh, along the way, we've re-engaged with, with an advisory panel, uh, which is a, a, a panel of, of resident experts in the development industry that happened to call Lakewood home. Um, they were originally met formed to, to evaluate RFP proposals, but, but since we're coming back to, to update this, it, uh, the, the CASTO proposal, it felt, it felt right to, to bring them together and, and, and help advise us on these new updates. And they've been tremendous, tremendously helpful in, in our conversations, uh, continued conversation with the CASTO and North Point. Um, so as this proposal starts to take shape, uh, we hope to soon be advancing that into the public review and zoning process in, in, in the near future. So stay tuned. There's there's a lot there's a lot happening behind the scenes to just update things, but then as we move into the, the, the public review process, there will be a lot more uh, to happen and a lot more to conversation that's going to be be focused just specifically on this development and and how it fits when with the, the the community's development objectives for the property. So. So that's, that's our uh, development update, as well as some hopefully some programs that you find helpful and can take advantage of. Uh, I encourage you to do that to the extent that you, you, you're, you're, you or, your, in, or your, your tenants are qualified. Uh, this is my contact information. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me or use me as a conduit to, to reach out to Mary Lee for any of those rehab programs, that rental rehab programs we have. Um, and from there, I'm gonna hand it back to, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Chris Parmalee uh, Chris is our building commissioner. Uh, he's going to walk you through a, a few items related to the building department and our housing license process. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, the 2021 Landlord Training Seminar. Um, thanks for showing up and taking a look. Got some pretty good information to pass on to you. Um, so let's let's do it. So brief introduction, my name is Christopher Parmalee. I'm the building commissioner and housing officer here in Lakewood, Ohio. Um, my family and I live in Lakewood. Currently have had three, but have two uh, in Lakewood City Schools. Uh, we love this place, walkable, diverse, uh, both economic and socially. The architecture, you can't beat it. Uh, we have a great sense of community um, and that's, that's what makes Lakewood unique. <clears throat> and we really appreciate the investment that you decided to make in our neighborhood um, to offer housing to our uh, fellow residents. Quick numbers here. This is pre-census data. Uh, we're, this shows 50,866 residents, um, about 9,285 residents per square mile. That number jumped a little bit. I think we're closer to uh, almost... We're north of 52, almost to 53,000 residents. Uh, we have 32,000 housing units. 45% of those housing units are owner occupied and 55% uh, percent of those are rentals, which is why we do this because half of our, a little over half of our housing stock um, is, is rental property. So a typical home value in Lakewood, uh, we're up to $259,204. That's 21.7% 21 up from last year, which is pretty amazing. There's a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of construction investment going on to date. Um, well, as of August 31st, we're up to just, just north of $58 million worth of project valuation. Uh, so that's commercial and residential projects in the city. Uh, we have 180 miles of sidewalk, believe it or not, 92 miles of road uh, in our small compact 5.6 square miles that, that we call home. Uh, so your interactions with the building department look kind of like this. I mean, we're not the 
you know, we're not the bad guys, you know, we're not out to get anybody. You guys made an investment in our community as much as we appreciate that. It's our job to make sure that these properties are maintained. Um, so we do have four full-time property maintenance inspectors that do exterior inspections. Those are completed from the public right away, street, sidewalk. Uh, we do safety and maintenance inspections on all rental properties. That's an interior uh, and in exterior inspection that encompasses the entire property. Um, so that would be the entire yard area, garage, full exterior inspection. That also includes the interior from basement to attic, including all units. Uh, we try to do these approximately every four years. You will get notified when it's your turn to have an inspection by, by mail. So on your housing licenses, make sure you have adequate information so this communication can get out to you. All housing license notifications, reminders, that's all sent via email through our automated system, CitizenServe. So sometimes that hits spam mail. Make sure you check your spam mail periodically uh, for communication from the building department. Uh, we do certificate of code compliance inspections. Most of the landlords and real estate agents know those as point of sales. We just don't call them that. They are required when you sell your rental property. Uh, if a property has been used for rental within the past 24 months, you're subject to this inspection before transfer. Uh, we also do building plan approvals. We do permit issuance, all permit inspections based on state building codes. Uh, we register all the contractors in the city. We register all the food trucks in the city. So we do, uh, we, we do a lot here. Um, again, we issue housing licenses. Every rental property is required to have one of those. To be, able, to be a legal rental property in the city of Lakewood, you need a housing license. Uh, we also respond to complaints, whether they be a tenant, a neighbor, a city official, a uh, city neighborhood police officer, uh, if you do have a tenant that makes a complaint, you know, we respond to those. Um, they can't be anonymous if the tenant lets us into the structure. So they can file a complaint. They can let us into any common area that any one of your tenants would have access to and their unit. Um, you know, if they say, hey, my neighbor upstairs is having a complaint too, she gave me a key, you know, said we can go in there and inspect. We can't do that. We need to be invited into that dwelling unit to conduct an inspection. Um, one of my favorite things to go over here is keep your grass cut. We send out, I don't know how many high grass notices during the year. Those high grass notices, once one gets sent out, that notice stays open for the calendar year. You will not be reminded to cut your grass. We send a correction notice. If you don't respond to that correction notice, we put it on the cut list for the following week. And our folks at Public Works, they jump on these things and get them cut quick. I guarantee you, you can do a better job. Cut your grass, keep your, keep your lot looking nice. Same thing, um, keep your walk shoveled. As you know, City of Lakewood, we don't we don't have city busing for children or anything like that. So all the kids are walking to school, whether they're kindergartners or high schoolers. Uh, we're one of the most walkable communities in the state. Uh, we ask that you keep your sidewalks clear, whether it's an agreement you have with your tenant. Um, and if you do have mixed use rental property, you know, a commercial building with commercial storefront apartments above it, it is your responsibility to shovel those public walks on the right of way uh, and city corridors. So we wanna make sure we keep everything walkable for everybody in the community. That's pretty important. And again, let me reiterate, please keep the grass cut. Uh, springtime is, is horrific for that. So uh, let's talk about some housing licenses. Went over this a little bit, but this is more in detail. All non-owner occupied single family, two, three family, multi-family condominiums or vacant properties are required to have a housing license or vacant property registration. Um, <clears throat> if you're the owner and personally occupy 
a single family home, which is obviously not a rental, or you have a two family that you live in and rent either the upstairs or the downstairs, whichever unit you don't live in. Those are the only two rental type properties that are not required to have a housing license. Now, if you have a rental property, it's an Airbnb perhaps, you know, you, it's a short-term rental, single family home, two family, multifamily, doesn't matter. Airbnbs fall in the same category as a rental property. So you are required by our codified ordinance to carry a license on that property. Um, all housing licenses expire November 1st. They're non-transferable, can't be prorated. So you know, when you secure a license, that, that gets you through the calendar year, um, through the next November. We do open up housing licenses uh, August 1st of every year. So you can apply for your 2022 license starting August 1st. We send out notification, usually August, September, We'll send two in October. Uh, the last one is gonna be probably the last week of October. If you do get a housing license reminder email and you paid for your housing license, disregard the email, just delete it. Uh, we have the system set up. We have a third party software company. Uh, so when you pay for a housing license, it's supposed to take you off the email list. Sometimes it doesn't. So again, if you haven't, if you get three, four emails from us stating apply for your housing license and you already did so, just disregard. Um, it could be you know, annoying, but we do that to help remind folks. Just on the flip side of that, if we didn't do that, folks would want to know why they haven't been reminded about their housing license. Valid email address. I can't stress enough on how important that is. Um, we do 99% of our notification via email. We used to send out letters uh, to remind you to pay for your housing license. It's very expensive. It costs taxpayer dollars that don't really need to be spent in this day and age because uh, we have the technology. So make sure you check your spam mail. Sometimes citizen serve, it's, it's all sent from citizen serve. Um, Sometimes those emails do get trapped in spam folders. It all depends who your email provider is. So keep an eye on that spam folder. Uh, late fees are assessed for housing licenses secured after November 1st. Those late fees are $25 per dwelling unit. So if you have a single family, it's 25, two family, it's 50, three family and so on. You know, if you have a multi-tenant building, it can get really expensive. So make sure you get your housing licenses paid for and secured by November 1st. Uh, the housing license needs to be posted in a common area visit, uh, visible by all tenants. So multi-family building, usually in a vestibule, uh, single family, two family homes, usually at side door entry, you know, go, go to drug mart, get a cheap frame, throw it in there, keep that thing posted. Um, that's again, it's required by the ordinance. If you decide to sell your rental uh, and the buyer will also use it as a rental property, uh, your agent and the buyer's agent need to understand that's their responsibility. We do not chase these down. Uh, people do get through the cracks essentially, but we will find out um, by periodic inspections. We'll get a phone call. We'll find out that the water bill is going to the property owner's name in North Olmstead, so then we know it's a rental and then you have to secure a housing license and you wind up getting hit with a late fee. So we don't want you to you know, incur any extra expense. If you have uh, any questions or you wanna look through these specific ordinances, uh, at the end of the presentation, there's a link for City of Lakewood Codifieds and you want to review and pay attention to 1306.43 through 1306.53 uh, for any additional requirements. So this is kind of quick crash course in housing licenses. Um, there's more specific legal language in the ordinance if you are so inclined to review that. Um, housing licenses, again, it's all online. This link, uh, citizenserve.com slash Lakewood OH. If you're new to Lakewood, new to housing licenses, you go to create a user account, just like you would for any other online account, be it, you know, Amazon, Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, fill out the housing license information on the application. Uh, anything with a red line next to that question or information that's required information, it will not let you complete the application without the required info. 
uh, attendant information, you know, all that, all that good stuff. Um, if you have any questions on completing the application, feel free to call us 216-529-6270. <clears throat> if you don't have internet access or you don't have access to a PC to, to do this, we have, we have two kiosks set up um, here in the building department. Uh, we have three front office staff that will be more than more than happy to help walk you through the process. Uh, if this is not a new housing license application, you simply uh, click renew application that saves you from having to enter all your data. Again, um, you know, if your tenants change, log into your account, change the tenant information, please retain your username and password. We can recover the username. We can't recover your password. So you, there's a little chat bubble on the CitizenServe public facing portal that you can use to go back and forth with uh, support from CitizenServe. And again, like I said, if you need uh, assistance finalizing the application, give us a buzz 529-6270. You can remit payment um, right through the portal. If you don't like paying for anything online, you can call in over the phone. Uh, if you don't like paying for things over the phone, you can send us uh, a check for those fees. And once we enter them into the system, you know, we can print out your receipt. When you go online and pay through CitizenServe, you do have the option to print out your receipt and your housing license once that's complete. Um, fee structure for housing licenses is on the right hand side of your screen. Any non uh, uh, owner occupied condominium is $45 per unit. Rooming houses containing two or more tenants, $60 per unit. Non owner occupied one or two family structures, 70, uh, $75 per dwelling unit. Caveat here is if you have a three family home and occupy one of the three units, you still have to secure a housing license, but those are $60 per unit that you do not live in. So three family, owner occupied, $120 uh, housing license. All their occupied structures, $45 per dwelling unit. Again, any payment made after November 1st will have a late fee assessed of 25 per dwelling unit. There is a cap um, for any occupied structures with a single license has been issued. So if you have multi-tenant building, you know, apartment building, 40 some suites, uh, the, the max you will pay for the housing license is $3,500. Um, vacant property licenses, you know, are below bottom right hand corner. Vacant housing structures are $200 per structure. And that goes for the same vacant commercial or mixed use building is going to be this $200 per structure. Somebody says, why do I have to pay to have a vacant building in the city of Lakewood? Well, by paying for that housing license, you provide us your contact information uh, in, as, just as well as any other license in the city, you know, in case we have an issue, again, like I talked about high grass, we have to go remove snow, heaven forbid there's, there's a house fire, uh, first responders need to have access to the system and know how to get, a con to, uh, get in contact with, same thing with PD, um, if there's a Nuisance on the property, you know, there's there's tenant issues. Police department's been over there several times. We just need to have the contact information. And there's a lot of city, city services that get used, you know, when it comes to these licenses. So we can't uh, have you pay for anything unless we provide a service. So those are the services we provide. So again, some quick resource links, uh, citizen serve. That's our customer facing portal. Not only can you use that for housing licenses, you can use that, uh, you create the same, you can use the same account you have for housing license to go online and apply for permits, um, submit construction documents for residential projects. You can even have access to any other property data we have in the city. So if you're inquiring to see, you know, if there's any permits on a property down the street from your rental, you can log into CitizenServe do a property search. It'll give you all the information pertaining to that. There's a link here for the Residential Code of Ohio. So any construction project you decide to do with your rental, update a kitchen, update a bathroom, build a new garage, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the codes that we use here in the state of Ohio for constructions and alterations. Um, I spoke to it earlier in the presentation about our zoning code. There's a link right there 
uh, that amlegal.com, that is the link to our city codified ordinances. So if you have any questions or want to do a little digging um, on a city ordinance, that's your information to use there. Uh, building department, we're here Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's not listed here. Uh, any visitor that decides to come to City Hall and wants to come to the building department to ask questions, fill out permits, like a you know, housing license. We all know the day and age we live in. Uh, Everybody is required to wear a mask at all times when you are in the City Hall building. That does not exempt you to not wear a mask in the building department. Um, last but not least, you made it through the presentation. So go to the virtual landlord training seminar completion form. Uh, fill that information out because when you go to secure your housing license, it's going to ask you if you attended the landlord training seminar. Uh, you're going to hit yes, and it's going to want a copy of that form. So you're going to have to upload that uh, into your housing license account. <clears throat> Again, we're all, we're always available. You can always call the main line six two seven zero. You know, be it a rental question, a property maintenance question, a building code question, you just want to call and say hi. We're 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 here to pick up the phone. Um, this is when when we used to be live. I do a Q and A. Uh, it was always pretty fun. We always had some pretty pretty good questions. You can always you can email us at housing.building uh, at lakewoodoh.net or building.permits at lakewoodoh.net or give us a ring 216-529-6270. Depending on what time of day it is, uh, enjoy the rest of your morning, the rest of your afternoon, or the rest of your evening. And if you need us, you know where to find us. Thank you for participating in this year's Landlord Training Seminar. Thank you.